All right, thanks for watching. And today I wanna show that every vector space has a basis. You might be like, every vector space? Yes, every vector space. Not just finite dimensional ones, but also functions or other fun things. And it involves Zwan's lemma, and which is funny because in German, Zwan means angry. That's why I probably put an angry thumbnail on that. Okay, and unfortunately, there are a lot of definitions you need to know, so let's start with the definitions. So step one. Okay, first of all, what would it mean for a set to be maximal? So let F be a family of sets of sets and an element M in F is called maximal basically if it's if no element is bigger than M in some sense in other words if M is contained in no other member of F. Member of F. Well, except itself, because it's always contained in itself. So uh, in other words, there's uh, no other member that's bigger than it, that sort of includes the element. So other than itself, and I'll draw a picture in a second. And also give an example, because I mean, this is quite a complicated concept, but I'll try my best. So suppose you have a family of sets, in this case, sort of family of circles. Then again, F is just a set of all those circles. So F is here, like here's a circle, here's a circle, here's a circle. Then a maximal element is not one that contains everything. That would be something, a biggest element, but one that's not bigger. Uh, so, so one that's uh, such that nothing is bigger than it. So for example here, the maximal element would be this circle, but also this circle. Because you see, there's no element of F, so there's no circle here that contains M, right? So in other words, if there were another bigger circle, then M wouldn't be maximal because there would be a bigger circle containing it. For example, this circle, it's not maximal because this one contains a smaller circle. But M, there's nothing bigger than that. And in particular, notice, the maximum element doesn't have to be unique because both of those are maximal. There's nothing bigger than that, but they're not the same. And let me give you another example. So suppose F are the sets. One, one, two, one, two, three, but also four. So if you want, just in terms of dots, we have this set, this set, and this set, but we also have this set. Then there are two maximal elements. One is, the element, the set one, two, three, so this bigger circle, because this bigger circle, there's no member here that contains one, two, three, and the smaller circle, because also there's no element in F that contains four. If there were like four, three, then there would be a bigger element. So there are two maximal elements here, one, two, three, and four. That's the first thing. So this is a, a maximal element, again, one that's not bigger, that, such that nothing is bigger than this. Think of peaks of mountains. Another thing is a chain, and a chain is precisely that. So a chain is just a family of sets where either one is smaller than the other, or the other one is smaller than the other one. So, so, or I guess it's a Chen, you know, like Chen Lu. So C is a chain. If for every 
element in that chain, either A is contained in B or B is contained in A. Just for an example, uh, take the set C to be the set 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., etc. In other words, think of like an increasing family of sets. What we're increasing just means um, inclusion. So this, this would be a chain. You see, because for every set, Either one is smaller than this, the other, or one is bigger than the other, okay? All right, now that we have our definition, so a maximal element and a chain, I can finally uh, talk about Swan's lemma. And it's not the full version here, it's a version where ordering is set inclusion, but for this talk it's enough. So, um, in Swan's lemma, what it answers is, when does a family have a maximal member? So how can you find, like, find out if a family has a peak or not? And the idea is actually kind of similar to calculus. And it's similar to the following theorem. Suppose you have a function that's increasing and that's bounded above then you know that that function has a limit. And it's the same thing here. In other words, if you have a chain, which is an increasing function of sets, and it's somehow bounded above, so it's contained in something, then that chain has a limit, or if you want, a biggest, a maximal member. So, now to the formal statement. And again, it's quite a difficult statement. All right, then, what does Chuan's lemma say intuitively? Or I guess, what does it say? So suppose you have some family of sets F with the following property. Whenever you take a chain, so again, whenever you take an increasing function, if you want, in your set, it's always bounded by above. So maybe there's some element, let's say this, in F, such that C is bounded above by this set, so U and F, then it turns out the family F itself must have a maximal element. Let's say this box here. So now, up to the definition, uh, uh, I mean, up to the lemma. So if for every chain C, chain C, there is a member member U of F okay, and very important U doesn't have to be in C it, you know, it could be in C but not necessarily necessarily in C that contains every member of C every member of C of C then it turns out that F has a maximal element in other words an element in F such that Nothing in F is bigger than that. So it would be in this picture, and in terms of the other stuff I wrote, it would be something like that. So some circle here, that's M. And again, the family F can look like this also. Right, and then sometimes U is M, but Usually not, so uh, so in other words, it's a criteria, easy criterion that guarantees we have a maximal element. Namely, whenever you have an increasing sequence of sets, if you want, in your family, and you know there's some upper bound to it, then we know that the 
sequence has a maximal element. And heuristically, what this also means so in applications, if you do some process infinitely many times, and you'll see what we mean by that, and um, if you do it infinitely many times, then it turns out at some point in infinity, you have to stop. Because at some point what this says, you have a maximal element. And in fact, it makes sense because if there is no maximal element, it means you can just go above and above and above and above, but then there wouldn't be an upper bound for your set. All right, so that's first thing. That is Swan's lemma, and it's super important and super equivalent to the axiom of choice, uh, but that's a different story. Um, what does it have to do with bases? And for this, let me define the notion of a basis, but for uh, infinite spaces. So step two. So what is a basis? And for this, let's consider the space R3. And we know that a beta, which is, let's say, the standard basis, 0, 0, 1, is a basis. Because, first of all, it's linearly independent. And it turns out, if you add another vector to it, it won't be linearly independent anymore. In other words, the only linearly independent subset that contains beta is just beta. And in fact, uh, because linear and you know, not redundant if you want, and I'll give you the definition. So here's the definition then. So beta, uh, is a, an, it's not quite a basis, but we'll show it's equivalent to a basis. So beta is a maximally linearly independent subset of V if, first of all, of course, it's linearly independent. And also, it's as big as possible. In other words, uh, the only linearly independent set which contains beta is beta itself. So, and I'll give you an example in a second. So the only linearly independent subset of V that contains beta is beta. <laughs> In other words, there's no bigger linearly independent subset. So if you have this basis, if you have, I guess, this maximally linearly independent set, beta, and you add another vector to it, then that vector wouldn't be linearly independent anymore. Otherwise, it wouldn't be maximally linearly independent. So, for example, if you consider this set, so beta, which is 1, 0, 0. This is not maximally linearly independent because there's a bigger linearly independent set that contains beta. So not maximal because the following set, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, is a linearly independent subset of V that contains beta. And in particular, you see that if something is a basis, then it is maximally linearly independent because adding vectors to it doesn't make it linearly dependent anymore. And the beautiful thing is, um, Maximally linearly dependent actually also applies that it's a basis. And remember, a basis is linear independence plus span. And so let me show that fact one. And don't worry, we're almost at our uh, proof. I know it's, I've been rambling a lot about this, but I think it's important. So fact one. 
So if beta is maximally linearly independent, uh, is a maximally linearly independent subset of V, then beta is a basis. Of v. And why? Well, first of all, beta is linearly independent, just by definition. And also, let's show it spans v. Well, suppose the span is not v. Suppose span of beta is strictly smaller than v. What does that mean? It means there is a vector v star that's not in the span of beta. So it exists v star in v with v star not in the span of beta. But then what does that mean? It means we can add a vector to beta that still makes it linearly independent. In other words, if you add v star to your basis, you get a bigger linearly independent set. But then beta union v star, so if you add this vector to beta, it's also linearly de independent. Because if not, then v star would be in the span, but it's not. And this contradicts the fact that beta is the biggest linearly independent set in, uh, in v. So, uh, but beta is maximal. This is a contradiction. In fact, I don't know why I wrote fact one, it's just fact. So, in other words, maximally linearly independent sets, there are bases and vice versa. And now, let me show our theorem. So, now we are ready to do this. And again, if you fast forward it, hello, welcome back. Um, Every vector space V has a basis. Why? Well, by what we've just shown, we just need to show that there's a maximally linearly independent subset of V. There exists maximally linearly independent subset of V. And um, yeah, and so in particular, let's apply Tan's lemma because we want to find a maximal element. So let F be the family of all linearly independent subsets of V. And in order to apply Tan's lemma, we need to show that for every chain. It's bounded above. So suppose C is a chain in F. In F, so again, uh, suppose let's say this is maybe your family and you have a chain. So this is C. So sorry, this thing, this ring here is C. And what you want to show is that there's some element in F that contains every member of C. So show there exists U and F that contains. Sorry, let me write W. You will be confusing. Uh, contains each member of C. Of C. So suppose you have this ring. You sort of want to find something in F that encompasses this ring. So this is W. Some, some out. And well, how do we find this? It turns out here is easy. So suppose you have all those elements, C, C, and C. Then it turns out W is just a union of everything. It's like the, the union of all those rings. Lord of the rings. 
union of the Lord of the Ring or something. So let W simply be the union over all those sets. So let W be the union over all those rings of those rings. So again, we have this thing here, all those things, and then let's say W is that the union of everything. Well, look, because we have the union for every, for every ring, so for every element, it has to be contained in W. That's just the definition of union. You just put everything together. So by definition of union, For all you know, rings in C, well, C is contained in W. So that's good. So basically, W contains each member of F, but uh, the only issue is we have this set, but we still need to check that it's in F. That's the important thing about Son's lemma. It doesn't matter that it contains each member of C. It also has to be a member of our family. So you have to show that W is linearly independent. So show W is in F. So W linearly independent. And here's what saves us. So even though W might be infinite, the definition of linear independence just requires that we take finite linear combos. So suppose you have this finite sum a1u1 plus dot 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 plus anun equals zero, where u1 up to un is in w. So again, we have this thing here, w, and then we have all those elements u1, maybe u2, u3 etc etc now by definition of a union each of those ui's is in one of the rings so each of ui is in ci so by definition of union so the union is just uh, the set of things that are in one of those sets so the definition of union ui is in ci for some i so for some CI in your collection. So, for example, here, this would be C1, and then this would be C3, and then this would be C2, whatever. And then, well, here's the thing. The set collection C, it's a chain. So in particular, you know, each one of them is included in the other one. So the point is all those vectors, even though they're in these different sets, they're always uh, an element of this common set, which is just the biggest one. So if you want, it's the union of C1, C2, C3 up to Cn, which is still part of the family because then you're taking a finite union. So, but since, C is a chain. UI is an element of some common C. Namely, C is C1, union C2, da, 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 union Cn. And the point is because we have a chain and we're just taking finitely many elements, the union of those finite elements is still an element of your chain. So here, if you take the union of those four circles, you get the biggest circle, which is still an element of your circles. It's still a circle, so it's still okay. So the point is, we have this linear combo that gives you zero. The u1 up to un, there is some common element of your chain. And again, what, what about the chain? Well, each chain is a member of your family. So in particular, C is an F. 
So, uh, so C, well remember it's in the chain and chain is part of the family. So C is in F. But remember what is F? It's just the set of linearly independent subsets. So, um, so C is linearly independent. And because now we get A1U1 plus dot 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 plus ANUN equals zero. And all those vectors, they're in C, and C is linearly independent. We get A1 equals zero, dot dot dot, AN equals zero. And therefore, by Tsuan's lemma, there is a maximal element, so Tsuan, there exists M in F maximal. And therefore, remember definition of F is a linearly independent subset, so M is a maximal linearly independent subset of V. So M is a basis. And again, this is a beautiful proof. And notice, especially what was in play, first of all, it's important that in the definition of linear independence, you just take finitely many linear combinations that give you zero. Because it's finite, the union of those finite sets, it's still a set in C. This would not be true for infinitely many sets. And also notice how the chain condition was used. We use the fact that one of them is smaller than the other, so the union is the bigger one. For general sets, that's not true. If you take two sets that are not included, the union isn't equal to any of them, the two. But because we have a chain, this works. All right, so I hope you like this excursion into Tsuan's lemma, and again, very powerful lemma. And if you like this and want to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.